our next question is from a listener named Jack, and he references the book and says, in your book, Hope Not Nope, you mentioned ACL surgery is not always needed. How do we know when or when not it should be done? Jack, great question. I feel like the, these questions are like, they're pretty simple, but they're very long winded answers, answers because <laughs> this one we have to set the groundwork for. Sure. Because people listening, they might go, what? No, if you tear your ACL, you need to get it reconstructed. And if you don't get it reconstructed, then you can't return back to these activities or these sports or things like this. And really, in the football spirit, <laughs> John Elway actually played without an ACL. Not his whole career, but in the Super Bowl, I forget what year it was, maybe 98. I don't, I'm not sure. But the year that they won the Super Bowl, John Elway tore his ACL. And they, they said, you need to have surgery on it because that was the practice at the time. That was the cert that was the protocol at the time. And John always said, I'm not getting a surgery. I want to play in these games. Like I have fought this whole season. I fought my whole career for these moments. I'm not just going to stop playing. So he just refused it. And because he refused it, he doubled down on quad strengthening on quad reactive stability, did a really good quad strengthening program. And he played and he played well. Wow. without having the surgery. There's been other players that have done it. Uh, Dewan Blair, Heinz Ward, a lot of really high level professional athletes that have torn their ACL, not had the surgery, and then performed well. After the season, they may go and have it done. But that's a whole different story because they, they're making a lot of money per week. Mm -hmm. They're making a lot of money per day. If you're not going to have the surgery, then you would be defined as a coper and that could take two to three months to identify if you're going to be a coper or a non-coper. So if a person, a professional athlete that's making all this money per day, if they go two months and then they're identified as a non-coper, well, they just lost out on two months of money. Mm. So professional athletes tend to be rushed into it unless they decline it. But from that, the general public has now gotten the idea that this is how you manage ACL injuries, is that you need to have the surgery done. And there's research out of Delaware that has really shown that, no, you don't need an ACL reconstruction. And there's a category or these assessments that'll let you know if you're a coper or non-coper. So briefly what they are is, is, in general terms, is can you restore good quad strength and good stability? Because then that's going to take over the job of the ACL. Secondarily, can you move and not have an episode of buckling or your knee giving way? Because that now identifies that the quad in this feed forward mechanism is, is doing its duty. Quick, quick kind of side rant from this is like, <laughs> I always struggled in school when we learned that the ACL is a primary restraint to tibial anterior, anterior translation. What that means is the shin, the thigh bone, the ACL would prevent the shin from moving forward. But we're always taught the ACL is a primary restraint to tibial anterior translation. But the only reason that the ACL would tear is because the feed forward mechanism has failed. The feed forward mechanism is that the brain has already sent the signal down to the leg, down to the body, to the movement system to contract in the way that it needs to contract to do that movement. When that feed forward mechanism has failed, that's when the ACL tears. So the way I look at it is our primary restraint to anterior tibial translation is the feed forward mechanism of our neuromuscular system the secondary restraint then becomes the ACL. So with that being said, if this is now the secondary restraint, then what if we focus our time on the primary restraint, which is that feed forward mechanism? And if we focus our time on that, this person likely doesn't need to have the surgery. There's a lot of research showing this now. There's research showing that the ACL may even heal on its own in one to 4% of the population. Wow. But the, the coper non-coper, there's now further research showing long-term that if the person was first identified as a non-coper, meaning that they would be a candidate for surgery, but they don't have the surgery, a year later, they're now identified as a coper, hmm. which then really begs the question, do we need the ACL reconstruction at all? And I think sometimes we do. If the knee is it's very unstable, it's buckling a lot, it's a younger athlete because this research is in people from like 18 to 35. So if someone's 14 or 15 years old, I don't know if we can take that data and apply it to this population. Okay. But I think the conversation goes, 
well, let's at least give people a chance. Let's at least present this data to them and give them that option that if you do this really good quad strengthening program, you use progressive overload, you decrease your kinesiophobia, which is your, your fear of the movement, and you feel confident that you can get back to your sport, then let's use that option. If you're terrified of this thing and you're not going to be dedicated to a good non-surgical program, okay, then, then maybe we can offer that. So how do you know if you need the surgery? Wrapping that up, <laughs> if your knee is buckling, if your quad isn't able, able to restore its previous ability. Um, and I think those are the two main ones. Okay, so it's not as black and white of no one needs the surgery and everyone needs the surgery. It, it really just depends on the person, the situation. And, and in some ways, their belief system of if you really believe you need the surgery, then yeah. you probably should get the surgery because you believe that that's what's going to heal you. But if you believe that you can do all these other things and go through that rehab program and, and things like that, then that might be the, the better route. One question within that, does it matter? Like how, what's the healing process for these things? So someone tears their ACL, decides not to have the surgery. Is it like a still 12, 12 months versus they tear their ACL, have the surgery? Like what's the recovery? Yeah. So if they, if they are a coper and, and, they stay in that coping category and they do really well in the pro they can get back sooner rather than later. Okay. So they can get back. It's hard to give a time frame because it depends on how dedicated that they are to the program. Sure. But we're looking at like a range of four or five, six months, maybe seven months where if you have the surgery, it should be a, at a minimum nine months before wow. that athlete returns. A lot of people are getting cleared at seven months because the healthcare system is saying, yeah, checked off. You're good to go but they're not getting good functional tests done. They're not mm. getting a good level of quad strength measured. They're not going through a good quad strengthening program and, and then they end up having a high risk for retear. So that is one thing I tell athletes is that we can do this non-surgically. And if we do this, and let's say that you start as a, as a coper, but then you turn into a non-coper, well, your outcome after the surgery is now even better because of the prehab that you did before mm -hmm. going into it. So there's really not lost time. And that, that, that tends to get people. But one story that I can share that comes up is that there's a lot of factors that go into this. Like one for a pro athlete, it's, it's money, it's agents, it's all the stressors that they take. But then what about the general population? I, I was working with this one individual who was a coper phenomenal, like back mountain biking, back doing CrossFit, back doing high level activity, and he was doing great. But this individual still had a fear of what if my knee does buckle? What if my knee does give way? It, it just doesn't feel right. A part of this too was also that he was switching job positions and he wasn't sure what his healthcare insurance was going to be. And because of that, he goes, well, maybe I should just have the surgery mm -hmm. while I have the insurance because I don't want to get two years into this, have an occurrence of my knee buckling and then not have the insurance to be able to pay for this. So it was a tough decision. And I remember him being pretty torn up and almost like, like he was afraid to share it with me because he thought I would be disappointed. And I was like, no, man, like I understand that. And if that's what you want to do, then let's do that. Here's the best surgeon that I would go to in, in our area. And once you finish that up, we're going to get right back into the program and I got you. Mm. And, and just to see his shoulders go from being attached to his ears back down to this nice resting position was a beautiful thing. So, you know, it, it's really coming alongside that person's decision, but it's more of a question of, can we get people the information, the full story that then allows them to truly make that decision? Because there's other research showing the way that is presented will dictate if a person has a surgery or not. And this has been shown in the shoulder, for example, of, yeah, there's a 40% chance that you'll do okay from this rotator cuff repair versus, yeah, it's a flip of a coin. You could do a conservative management program or you can do surgery and both are going to lead to a good outcome. Like when people are presented with that, they tend to not choose the surgery. But when people go, yeah, no, go and try that thing, but you're going to need surgery. Most of the time they're going to end up needing surgery, not because they actually need the surgery, but because that seed was planted. Right. 
Well, I think that's the case for communication in general. Like if it's, it's not just the words you say, but it's how, it's how you say it and your, your body posture and and Mm -hmm. nonverbal cues. And when people are in a doctor's office or what have you, and they're getting this information, depending on the posture of the person delivering the information and the and the posture of the receiver of, you know, what they're nervous about or what, or if they're excited or whatever, that's going to play a role. And and we desire to just get you the information ahead of time and, mm. or maybe not ahead of time, but just to give you the information so that you can make a, a better decision about it. 